In the beginning, there was naught but noon, god of the primordial ocean, personification of the abyss. From chaos must arise order, and so the great mound, known as Ben-Ben to the Egyptians, arose from noon. On this mound grew a lotus flower, and from the flower emerged Ra-Atum, guider of the pharaoh. Ra-Atum then spat out of his mouth, creating Shu, the god of air and wind, and Tefnut, the goddess of moisture. This divine pair then gave birth to another couple, Geb, the god of earth, and Nut, his wife and goddess of the sky. From the union of sky and earth arose four divine children. Set, the lord of the desert and chaos. Osiris, ruler of the living. Isis, goddess of motherhood and magic. And Nephthys, protectress of children and the family. Ra-Atum, Shu, Tefnut, Geb, Nut, Set, Osiris, Isis, and Nephthys. These are the primal nine gods of Egypt, the divine Ennead. Osiris and Isis, representations of birth and life, paired up, while Set and Nephthys, mirror representations of death and chaos, did so as well. Osiris became king of Egypt, also known as Ta Kemet, the Black Land, while Ra Atum left Earth to rule the heavens. Set became envious of Osiris and devised a plan to murder his brother. Set invited the gods to a great banquet, and while they were there, he revealed a surprise competition. He unveiled a beautiful chest, saying that it would be given to whomever could fit in it. When Osiris lay down in this chest, Set murdered him, cut his body up into pieces, and scattered them across all Egypt. Isis then went on a journey across the land in search of her dismembered husband. She was able to find the pieces with the help of a sympathetic Nephthys, and reconstructed Osiris's body. Isis transformed herself into a radiant bird, and resurrected Osiris with magic. Osiris impregnated Isis with the sun, and left to become eternal ruler of the underworld. Eventually, Isis traveled to the underworld to give birth to her son Horus, the ruler god of Egypt destined to avenge his father in dethroned Set. The Egyptians' collective psyche is demonstrated in the stories they told, and we can learn much about what was important to them through analyzing their mythology. These myths, full of strange anthropomorphic gods, magic, and seemingly random explanations for why these things exist, are actually not nearly as random as they may first appear. In fact, lots of Egyptian mythology makes perfect sense once you understand what the world looked like to an ancient Egyptian. The center of life, prosperity, and abundance to an Egyptian was the Nile River, and its importance cannot be overstated. The Nile River flooded regularly, and left the surrounding soil extremely fertile. The river provided a narrow valley where the Egyptians could readily settle and organize a society. This fertile plain stood out among the dangerous and barren deserts surrounding it, and was an even better area for agriculture than Mesopotamia, a land bordered by two labyrinthian rivers which flooded randomly and violently. As the Egyptians settled in this valley and united, they formed a kingdom which would last for thousands of years. While the Middle East and the rest of Africa were full of rising and falling empires, Egypt remained a stable entity. Egypt remained in order. And that's the key. The Egyptians saw the dichotomy of order and chaos in everything around them. The fertile floodplain versus the hot desert. Life versus death. Peace versus war. These were all aspects of life that were very familiar to the ancient Egyptians, and they wanted to preserve order, also known as Ma'at, in their realm. They didn't want to eliminate chaos, they just wanted the divide between the two to be unbreached. This is why the pharaoh existed, as his duty was to preserve order in Egypt and hold chaos at bay. This is certainly why the god Horus was so heavily associated with pharaonic power. With this newfound knowledge, it is quite easy to spot some common motifs in the story relayed above. First off, with the importance the Nile had in ancient Egypt, it is of little surprise to know that their cosmogony starts with an eternal watery abyss. But, as stated earlier, chaos needs order. So the mound arose from the water, just as the fertile soil is revealed as the Nile recedes during the season parrot. Interestingly, the name used for this primeval mound, Ben-Ben, is the same Egyptian word used to refer to the capstones on the pyramids. Next, a lotus flower grows from the mound, which is something the Egyptians would have witnessed once the land had been revealed. This new life form on the land represented rebirth. Once the lotus flower bloomed, Atum arose from it. In fact, a famous sculpture of King Tutankhamun depicted him arising from the lotus just as the first god did. Another important motif in ancient Egyptian mythology is the concept of rebirth, which in itself is a symbol of order's triumph over chaos. The sun god Ra was believed to have died every night, where he would then pass through the underworld and be reborn in the morning. 
though some versions of the myth depict Ra being swallowed by the sky goddess Nut at sunset, passing through her body overnight and being rebirthed in the morning. Unsurprisingly, death and the hope of an afterlife permeated ancient Egyptian thought. The very details of the pyramids were given to aid the pharaoh in this passage, and one can retrace Egyptian religious thought through the years by examining their construction. The first pyramid builder, Djoser, constructed a six-stepped pyramid, with the entrance to the inner chambers facing north. These are both relevant factors, and they both point to the astral cult being the most important at the time. The step design was likely thought to be a sort of symbolic staircase which the pharaoh could use to ascend to the stars. More obviously, the entrance facing north would have been related to the idea that the pharaoh would become one of the circumpolar stars at his death. Later pyramids, notably the most famous ones built during the 4th dynasty, were true pyramids, which symbolized the rays of the sun. These pyramids had entrances facing east rather than north, which is related to the belief of the time that the pharaoh would be reborn as the rising sun after his burial. Another important factor is the fact that these pyramids, at the time, would have been encased in white limestone, causing them to shine like beacons. This is how the Great Pyramid earned its nickname, the Horizon of Khufu. Eventually, the Egyptians came to believe that even ordinary people could enjoy an afterlife, but their conception of this afterlife is different from what one might expect. The Egyptians came to believe that they would be able to pass into the eternal realm of Osiris, known as the Field of Reeds. Though there was no pain, suffering, sadness, or death in this afterlife, there was still work to be done, and the dead would tend their plot of land for all eternity. This conception of the afterlife shows the Egyptians' hope in continuing a simple, orderly life forever. This hope reflects their fear of the chaos that may follow death. As may be obvious by now, Egyptian religion was highly symbolic, and they believed what was written down, painted, or built would be perpetuated in the afterlife. This is why pharaohs had scenes of butchers, winemakers, bakers, and craftsmen etched onto the walls of their tombs. They believed that these scenes would carry over into the afterlife. Even colors had a symbolic importance in Egyptian art. Black, the color of the Nile's silt, was symbolic of fertility, as was green. This is why Osiris was painted with green, because he was an agrarian god as well as a god of the afterlife. The Egyptians famously worshipped a large variety of animal gods, and the symbolism may be more obvious here. Anubis was a god of death and mummification, and was depicted as a jackal. This is because jackals were commonly seen roaming about in cemeteries. Sekhmet was a war goddess associated with lions, and Tawarit was a goddess of childbirth and fertility associated with hippopotami, as female hippos were very protective of their young. But not all animal associations were purely symbolic. The Apis bull, for example. In Memphis, the Egyptians came to believe that the creator god Ta would incarnate himself as a bull in Egypt. The Egyptians would search across their land for the perfect bull, bring it to Memphis, and worship it. The Apis bull was so revered that Alexander the Great himself gave offerings to it upon arriving in Egypt. Many of these symbolic beliefs in the ancient Egyptian religion clearly arose from the geography and environment in which these prehistoric people settled. With such a naturally ordered environment to start a civilization in, the Egyptians' preoccupation with maintaining their orderly life is understandable. In the end, their beliefs completely revolved around the preservation of order and their anxiety that this balance between order and chaos may be lost. From the building of the pyramids and tombs to support someone in the afterlife, and the construction of statues and temples to maintain contact with the gods, to the system of pharaonic rule and preoccupation with keeping Egypt united and its enemies subdued, one could find this desire to maintain order in nearly everything that the Egyptians did.